Well, and uh, happy Sabbath, wherever we are at this moment, if it is Sabbath already in your place, like uh, the parts of uh, Africa and uh, some other parts of uh, different continents, we praise the Lord for the week that uh, has passed. And uh, we want to give uh, glory to him for the Sabbath he has given unto us so that uh, we may rejoice being in his presence and being able to learn uh, a few things that uh, he would like us to learn. And so I want to go into our late night presentation today. And uh, we are looking at the issue, the Israel of God journey uh, to the promised land then and now. And so let us pray and ask the Lord's blessings as we go through this. Dear Father in heaven, we are so joyous that uh, it is the Sabbath day where we have twofold blessing, both for physical and spiritual rest in thee. You have bidden us to come unto thee. We who are heavy laden and shall give us rest and peace to our soul. That is exactly what we need. And we need the ministration of heaven as uh, we approach you for Lord. We are human beings and the things of uh, heaven, it's only you who can guide us to do them aright. And so help us to be humble enough to listen to your voice speak to us. And uh, let the messages not be a means of condemnation, but a means of salvation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so uh, I'd like us to look at uh, this uh, special issue about uh, the, the journey of the Israel of God from uh, bondage, Egypt, to the promised land, which is Cana. And uh, mainly I'll be looking at the book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. The setting of the book itself, the book of Deuteronomy, is after the book of uh, uh, the, the, the other four books of the, the law. Now, Deuteronomy is not a standalone book. It is uh, a repetition of what you find in the book of Numbers. And uh, why does God go into much about repeating the things he has already spoken to his people? It is because Deuteronomy is written when these people are about to enter into the promised land. It was uh, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the terrible wilderness, and those who had rebelled against God had died. And here was a new generation, and it behooved Moses to retell the story of numbers to them. I believe this is where David got the idea of retelling also his generation of the same things when the heathens were raging, the people imagining vain things and the children of Israel were warring. After Balaam, David had to write the book or to retell the account of the Israel in the uh, second chapter of Psalms or the second division of Psalms. In, the, in verse 7, David says, I'll declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So there was uh, a retelling of the story to the new generation who had not been there or who may have forgotten the things that the Lord has spoken to their fathers. And so in the book of Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, we are told, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the way and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way? 
and uh, walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they say we will not walk therein. So the reason of things being rehearsed is so that the people may revisit their history, that they may not be found on the negative side of the equation. And so the question arises, who is there that is asking for the old past? The, the wilderness wandering was not only ordained as a judgment upon the rebels and murmurers, but it was to serve as a discipline for the rising generation preparatory to their entrance into the promised land. There is nothing new under the sun. People are not even concerned. They are about to miss heaven forever. The children of Israel were taken through the land, uh, the wilderness land from Egypt to Canaan. And we are like we are in a wilderness also, the Israel of God journeying to the promised land. And so their story is our story. Their history is our present news that we may learn from them and um, we may be able to seek the Lord for adventure that he may be found in this time. In the book of Hosea, chapter 12, verse 13, we are told, and by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet was he, Israel, preserved. Now, why did the Lord use the prophet to bring the children of Israel from Egypt going to the promised land? We get a hint in the book of uh, Second Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 20 where Jehoshaphat tells Israel, and they arose early in the morning and went forth in the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established, and believe in his prophets, so shall ye prosper. Is it that um, the people by forsaking the words of the prophets, they do not prosper. And you cannot say that uh, you will listen to God and reject his prophets because his prophets are his instruments. And so the reason why you see the church being in the state it is the whole Christendom is that uh, it has rejected true prophets, but it is interested in false prophets. And so the churches are not prospering. And at the same time, the churches cannot be established for if you reject the prophet, then you reject the one who have sent him. It is not a wonder that in this wilderness, as we journey forth just about to the borders of heavenly Canaan, no one is ready to stand and tell the remnant and profess church to believe in the Lord and the prophets. Hence, we are not established and are not ready to prosper in possessing the inheritance. And so let us look at the book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13. It is analysis. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, 3, we are told, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dream of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. That is Deuteronomy chapter 13. And we are looking at the history of the Israel of God from the land of Egypt to the land of promise, then and now, that their journey is our journey, and what kind of lessons can we learn from their journey? And so, the general counsel that you find in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, is that... Uh, the main purpose of them is to avoid the people who will come to them as true prophets 
or the prophets of the Lord and seduce them to go after the strange gods. And so the people of God during their journey from Egypt to Canaan, they were able to be seduced with those people who purported to be the messengers of the Lord, but they were not messengers of the Lord. And here in the antitypical journey from Egypt to Canaan or from the land of bondage to the promised land, Jesus warns us in the book of Matthew chapter 24, take heed that no man should deceive you. As Israel was deceived them then by people like um, Balaam, so today we shall have among us also those who will say they are Christ's, but uh, it shall turn out to be a lie. And how can we counter check or check those who are saying that they are the prophets of the Lord to the law and to the testimony if they not speak according to this word, there is no light in them. That is uh, Isaiah chapter 8, verses um, 20. And so the Lord says that thou shall not hearken unto the words of that person, that dreamer, notwithstanding, look upon him as a liar and not as a true prophet, for God cannot contradict himself. He cannot send a prophet to speak this and then lead the people away from the true worship. In uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 15, the ancient and honorable, he is the head, and the prophet that teaches life, he is the tail. And you find that the uh, Lucifer who was in heaven as the angel of the light was able to sweep a third of the angels with his tail, meaning that uh, he is a liar. The one who speaks lies, according to Isaiah 9, 15, he is um, uh, the tail. And so Moses warns and shows that he still pursues his intention in this chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 13. It is to remind the children of Israel of the eminent idolatry that might follow up the people if they do not take heed of the word of the Lord, then the Israel of the Lord from Egypt heading to the land of Canaan. The same warning that were with the prophet against these false prophets, uh, we are told that even in this time there shall be such a people. Now, what was the purpose of Moses writing to these people? He says, for the Lord your God proveth you that there might be an open and public discovery made, whether they sincerely loved God or not, or were steadfast in their religion. So uh, a need for them to be watchful. In the book of uh, Mark, we are told that Whatever I say to others, I say unto you also, watch. Why should we keep our eyes open? Because the enemy will want to blind us in some way or another. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 4 to 9, we are told you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dream of dreams shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shall thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. If thy brother, Deuteronomy 13 verse 6, if thy brother, the son of thy mother, Look at this. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him. 
neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be fast upon him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. That the children of Israel were being won against those who would want to seduce them to go after their own devising and not what the Lord had revealed unto them. Pity must not be shown to those who come to us clothed in the ship's clothing, but uh, inside there are ravening walls. We are told, do not conceal them in verse 8, Deuteronomy 13, verse 8. Do not conceal them, which means is that expose them, those who will come with an information that they have some news from God. But um, at the end of the day, they want to deceive the people to go into some false worship. Do not pity them. Do not conceal them. It means that... Um, they had to be careful. And how do you become careful in these things? It is by um, heeding to the scriptures. It is by being studious. It is being pious. The reason some, somewhat we don't uh, recognize false teachers and false prophets, it's because we ourselves are not studying the things that are being spoken of. And so when this person comes with this, you are ready to swallow it. If another person comes with this, you are ready to take it. And so we are swayed as a, a, a wind. We are shaken as reeds to this side and to that side. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, the Lord told Israel, do not hearken unto them. Do not conceal them. Rather, expose them. But they could not expose them unless they knew what was written or they have heard the voice of God. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 10 to 18. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 10 to 18. We are looking at uh, the Israel of God journey from the land of Egypt to the promised land then and now. What are the similarities? What are the things, the great issues we are facing? And how should we approach them? First of all, we are seeing that um, if anyone comes or came to Israel telling them that the Lord had sent him, yet his main purpose was to lead them away from the true worship of God, they had to reject him. Also unto us, we are to do the same. And the only way we can know this is ourselves if we are studying for ourselves. In Deuteronomy 13, 10 to 18, and thou shalt stone him with stones that he died because he had sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And all Israel shall hear and fear and shall do no more any such a wickedness as this among you. If thou shalt hear, uh, say in one of thy cities, which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell there, saying, certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you, and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, let us go and serve other gods which you have not known. Then shall thou require, inquire and make such and ask diligently. And behold, if it be truth and the thing certain that such an abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly and all that is therein and the cattle they are off with the edge of the sword, and thou shalt gather all the spoil of it unto the midst of the street thereof, and shall burn with fire the city and all the spoil thereof every, every whit. For the Lord thy God, and it shall be an heap forever, it shall not be built again. And where shall, and there shall cleave not of the cursed thing to thine hand, that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and shew thee mercy and have compassion upon thee, and multiply thee, as he hath sworn unto thy fathers. When thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep all his commandments, which I command thee this day, to do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord thy God. 
So another point that we are finding is that um, if these things happen, it will not just be to expose them, but rather we shall have to destroy the cities of those people who have who could have enticed Israel to go into wardom and idolatry. This means any kind of ecumenism was prohibited then. You shall not join into these people discussing even any good agenda that they may be having because their main purpose was to lead you into the wrong path so that you may not end up in the promised land. So any kind of ecumenism, whether it were good, thou shall not join in it, but thou shall destroy their agenda, whether good or bad, and then uh, you shall destroy their cattle. What, what was wrong with the cattle that they should be destroyed when it is only the people that had sinned? You have to remember that um, the, 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 the ancient nations used to sacredly hold unto their animals. They used to hold their animals sacred, and that is what uh, they worshipped. Rather than uh, 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 worshipping gold, some of these nations worshipped their animals. And so their cities were to be destroyed together with their cattle, which they had uh, dedicated as their gods. Nothing was to be incorporated in the worship of the true God that had been practiced by pagans and heathens or had been uh, uh, introduced by the false prophet. In Deuteronomy chapter 7 and in Deuteronomy chapter 12, we find in chapter 7, you shall not even give thy daughter or thy son for marriage to these people. In chapter 12, we are told, thou shalt destroy their altars. Thou shalt not build even the sanctuary or the steps to the altar as they did lest you be revealed your nakedness to the Lord and the Lord smite you from uh, his sanctuary. Why? Because their services and how they conducted them was centered upon the worship of their gods of woods, animals, and the gods that will not save, the gods that were moved by the hands of men. And also the practice, the things that they did on the altars were things which were prohibited. Take an example of making their sons go through fire and um, uh, dedicating them to their God Molech. These are the things that the Lord wanted the Israelites to remove amidst them. And we can mention, sometimes when we go to idolatry, we, when we talk about idolatry, we talk only of... Um, uh, maybe worshiping these strange gods or uh, Trinitarian gods and all that stuff. It is beyond that. Uh, idol worship will uh, entail, uh, you go back to the book of uh, Exodus chapter 20 and you look at the commandments, the commandment number one and the commandment number two. Anything that uh, really is uh, 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 not prescribed as part of the true worship, then will fall under idolatry because you are esteeming that thing above the Lord your God. Uh, and so anything that is not the revealed will of God and uh, it uh, leads people to themselves and away from centering their thoughts to God in the sanctuary of the Lord should be prohibited be it in dress reform, be it in uh, music, any reforms, or be it in um, church order, organization, and discipline. All these things tended to idolatry because we are told that you may, have a, you may not have a fashioned idol to worship, but your ideas may be your, uh, may, may, may be your idols. And so some of us in, in our churches, we, we, we abhor so much what Israel did, creating a golden calf or uh, molding a golden calf and worshiping, bow, bowing down to it. But you may find that we have made our theology our gods. We have made our doctrines our gods. And so idolatry exists among us on the highest level uh, so much that the common person in the church may not understand it, but... Uh, the people who are looking unto these things, who are reading their Bible, they may get 
people and understanding that uh, this is a form of idolatry which people are really practicing. And so uh, in case of the general defections of any place of idolatry, the judgment upon it is here determined in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 13. The dwellers of that city shall be destroyed and their name shall be wiped out of uh, 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 the records of the earth. And, uh, you know, with the Israel of old, we find that uh, the Lord visited them immediately when they did something wrong. But then, look at this in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes. Why do we go on doing the things that we are doing? That is the question that I ask myself. Because sended against an evil work is not uh, executed, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 11 to 13. Because sended against an evil work is not, execu is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil and a hundred times in his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are a shadow, because he feareth not before God. And uh, we are told in uh, the great Sanhedrin, who only could take cognizance of this crime were upon this information to send some on whose fidelity they could rely to examine the truth of the report which was spread abroad concerning the defection of a city to the worship of other gods who were to use their utmost care and diligence in this inquisition and by all possible means endeavor to find whether or not the information was true. But then that, that was Israel then that they could send a priest, they could send a judge to inquire if these things were so. Meaning, the priests of today, the judges of today, they should inquire what said the Lord. And then they should inquire what are the people doing? Is it according to that said the Lord or is, is it not according to that said the Lord? By, but uh, why is it that the priesthood of today cannot do that? Because the priesthood of today do not even know what is truth and what is lies? I, I, I may say not all, but uh, many of them do not know what is truth and what is lie. And so it is left um, to the uh, it is left to to the class to to the laity and to the common members of the church to inquire for themselves and to um, to research for themselves the things that you are hearing, the things that we are doing. Are they the things that the Lord approves them? Because our, our eternal salvation cannot really be entrusted to the hands of mortal men who also they are erring and they have lost a sense of what is truth. And that is why God says this in Malachi chapter 4, verse 1: For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud year, and all that do wickedly shall be subdued. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, said the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And why? Because they did not seek the Lord to know what is right and do it. And others who knew the truth turned it into a lie and led the people to uh, warring against uh, uh, the gods of uh, uh, this earth. Now, I, I, I like to raise one point in Ezra chapter 8, verses 21 to 23. Ezra chapter 8, verses 21 to 23. About this second point, we were talking about ecumenism and joining other people who are really defying the law of God, joining with them to do projects, joining with them to do uh, things um, as if their intentions were good, but uh, we, they make us hide our peculiarity. In the book of Ezra, chapter 8, verse 21 to 23, 
Ezra says, then I approached a fast there at the river Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and the horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. Because we had spoken unto the king, saying, the hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But uh, his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. Now, I want you to observe what we find in um, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4, page 72, uh, paragraph 3 onward. We are told in this journey from uh, Canaan to the promised land, and even when they were in the promised land and uh, they were in captivity, they wanted to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. What did uh, what happened at that time and what can we learn of, from it? The prophet and the, these fathers did not consider them the worshippers of true God these people that surrounded them. Ezra did not go to them for help because they did not consider them uh, the worshipers of the true God. And uh, though they professed friendship and wished to help them, they dare not unite with them in anything relating to his worship. And, and this is the uh, synopsis we get in the book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13, that they were not to join in any ecumenism when it came to matters relating to worship. Ezra knew that very well. And when they were coming from um, the, uh, um, the land of captivity to go back to rebuild Jerusalem, he did not come into ecumenism with these people who did not worship the true God. When going up to Jerusalem to build the temple of God and to restore his worship, they will not ask help of the king to assist them in the way, but by fasting and prayer sought the Lord for help. They believed God will defend and prosper his servants in their efforts to serve him. The creator of all things needed not the help of his enemies to establish his worship. He asked not the sacrifice of wickedness, nor accept the offering of those who have other gods before the Lord. And uh, we are told, uh, continue on 74.1 we often hear the remark you are too exclusive as a people we will make any sacrifice to save souls or lead them to truth but to unite with them to love the things that they love and have friendship with the world we dare not for we should then be at enmity with God the Israel of God in these last days are in constant danger of mingling with the world. Do you see that? In Deuteronomy chapter 13, the chapter we are looking at, they were forbidden to enter into any ecumenism when it came to worship. Also, we have not to enter into any ecumenism in the worship. And we are being told that the Israel of God in these last days are in constant danger of mingling with the world and losing all signs of their being the chosen people of God. Read again Titus 2, 13 to 15. We are brought down to the last days when God is purifying unto himself a peculiar people. Shall we provoke God as did ancient Israel? Shall we bring his wrath upon us by departing from him and mingling with the world and following the abominations of the nations around us? And then the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself and this consecration to God and separation from the world is plainly declared and positively enjoined in both Old and New Testament. There is a wall of separation with the Lord, which the Lord himself has established between the things of the world and the things he has chosen out of the world and sanctified unto himself. The calling and character of God's people are peculiar. Their prospects are peculiar, and these peculiarities distinguish them from all people. All of God's people upon the earth are one body from the beginning to the end of time. They have one head that directs and governs the body. The same injunctions rest upon God's people now to be separate from the world as rested upon ancient Israel. 
Look at this journey, God's Israel uh, 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 journey from uh, the land of bondage to the land of Canaan, the land of Egypt to the land of Canaan, and our journey from the land of bondage or from the wickedness of this world to the heavenly Canaan. We are told that um, uh, the same injunctions rest upon God's people now to be separate from the world as rested upon ancient Israel. The great head of the church has not changed. The experience of Christians in these days is much like the travels of ancient Israel. Please read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, especially from the 6th to the 15th verse, where we are told that these things were written for us who have come unto the ends of the world. They were written as ensembles. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The world is ripening for its destruction. God can hear with God can bear with sinners, but a little longer. They must drink the dregs of the cup of his wrath and mixed with mercy. Those who will be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ to the immortal inheritance will be peculiar. Yes, so peculiar that God places a mark upon them as his holy, uh, his. Thinking that God will receive honor and acknowledge a people so mixed up with the world that they differ from them only in name. Think about that for a moment. That the only thing we differ with people is the name Seventh Day Adventist. But um, our ways of life, our ways of talk, our health message, and our dress message, our character formation, our ways of worship, our ways of music, our ways of sacrifices, our ways of tithing, tithing and offer, offering is none different from what the other people are doing do you think god will accept a people just because of their name but their character is the same as the character of all the other fallen churches god forbid if uh, he he told israel to avoid these things and the israel of god from the beginning to the end is one and led by one head how do we think that he will accept anything less of what he required of the ancient Israel. It cannot be. And so let us take heed uh, about uh, the end time issue before us. We are journeying from the land of Egypt to the land of Canaan. And here we are as uh, the Israel of today, journeying from uh, 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 the ways we did things as Gentiles and enjoining ourselves to uh, the Israel of God by following what is revealed in his word. And so uh, we are again told that um, in the book Maranatha, many of the prophecies are about to be fulfilled in quick succession every element of power is about to be set to work past history will be repeated all controversies will arouse to new life and peril will will be set god's people on every side intensity is taking hold of the human family it is permeating everything upon the earth another page 30 paragraph 4 study revelation in connection with daniel for history will be repeated we, with all our religious advantages, ought to know far more today than we do know. That is uh, paragraph five. And then uh, we are told, uh, whatever, or we have no time to lose. Troublous time, times are before us. The world is stirred up with the spirit of war. Soon the sins of the trouble spoken in the prophecies will take place. The prophecies in the 11th, of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved and return and hath indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. We see evident that Satan is first obtaining the control of human minds, who have not the fear of God before them. Let all read and understand the prophecies of this book, for we are now entering upon the time of trouble spoken in of in Daniel chapter 12. Now, 
why are these prophecies so much of important to us when it is about rising and falling of nations? We are told in uh, another place, um, and uh, I'll give you just a reference right now. Um, uh, we are told that uh, in the in one one is same page four hundred and six paragraph one. The prophet of the Lord says, we want to understand the time in which we live. We do not have understand it. We do not have take it in. My heart trembles in me when I think of what a foe we have to meet and how poorly we are prepared to meet him. The trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just before the first coming of Christ have been presented before me again and again to illustrate the position of the people of God in the experience before the second coming of Christ. How the enemy sought every occasion to take control of the minds of the Jewish, and today he is seeking to blind the minds of God's servants that they may not be able to discern the precious truth. And so you find that even after these people entered into the land of Canaan, they corrupted themselves until God sent them into captivity. And uh, after being sent into captivity and God again seeing mercy, and uh, bring them out of captivity, these children of um, Israel, do you know what they did? They followed after the Roman customs. They followed after the education they got in uh, Egypt, uh, in, Medo in Medopatia, in um, Greece. They carried all that dirtiness into their a uh, new land into their new life in Israel. And so this was the main purpose of Satan to really make the children of Israel be, um, um, be taken out of the promised land. But today he is repeating the history so that we may not even step in the land of promise. The, the children of Israel, peradventure, they were able to enter into the land of Canaan, but they did not enjoy it. Soon they were taken out of it because of their corruption, because of their adultery, because of their adopting the systems of the fallen nations and the fallen churches, the heathens and the pagans. And um, the, same, uh, the same purpose that uh, Satan had for these people then, it is the same purpose that... Uh, uh, he is having for us. In PP 689, paragraph one, PP 689, uh, paragraph one, we read thus. Uh, Satan was, uh, Satan was determined to keep his hold on the land of Canaan. And when it was made the habitation of the children of Israel and the law of God was made the law of the land, he hated Israel with a cruel and malignant hatred and plotted uh, their destruction. Through the agency of evil spirits, strange gods were introduced, and because of transgression, the chosen people were finally scattered from the land of promise. Now look here. The history, this history, Satan is striving to repeat in our day. God is leading his people out from the abominations of the world, that they may keep his law. And because of this, the rage of the accuser of our brethren knows no bound. The devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 and 12. The antitypical land of promise is just before us. And Satan is determined to destroy the people of God and cut them off from their inheritance. The admonition, watch ye and pray lest you enter into temptation, Mark 14, 38, was never more needed than now. The word of the Lord to ancient Israel is addressed also to his people in this age. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defied by them. For all that do these things are in an abomination unto the Lord. Leviticus 19.31 and Deuteronomy 18 verses 12. And so we have the history of uh, the children of Israel in the book of Leviticus chapter, uh, chapter 13. 
And then the Lord is speaking unto us again. When the children of Israel corrupted themselves after even entering into the land of Canaan, they were sent the prophet Elijah. And uh, we are told also that um, before the dreadful uh, and terrible day, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, uh, God shall send Elijah the prophet before that day. And uh, what was the work of Elijah as we bring this to a close? What was the work of Elijah? In Deuteronomy 13, we have been told, regard them not who have strange gods. In Deuteronomy 6.15, we are told, you shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are around about you. As I have told you in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 to 6, also they are warned against this kind of uh, 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 idolatry and uh, kind of worship and their altar. And so Elijah was sent in Israel after they had entered into the promised land or the land of Canaan to be able to stand against this false worship that was in the land so that uh, the land may be cleansed and the, the people may be cleansed, that the Lord may have a people who will worship him in truth and spirit. And before the second coming of Jesus Christ, the same has to happen. And Elijah has to be sent to cleanse the church from the abomination that is happening, the false worship that we are having among us, the false gods we are having among us. We are told that in a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been sent in the world as watchmen and light bearers. And uh, to them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, the second, and the third angels' messages. Now, when you look at Revelation chapter 14, the first angel's message is fear God for the hour of his judgment is come. The second angel's message is um, Babylon is fallen, is fallen because she had made the earth drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So we are to warn the world that they are in the antitypical day of atonement and God regarded their character as the most important thing than any other thing. And you cannot have a right character if you don't have fellowship with Jesus Christ, which will enable you to keep his commandments and not be at defiance with them. You cannot proclaim Babylon is fallen when you are enjoying her culture, her social amenities, and all this stuff. And then we have the third angel's message, which is the most solemn message, righteousness by faith, that we do not have to walk by sight, but we have to walk by faith. Everything has to be the providence of God. And um, we should not sway a jot from the revealed will of God to be. Uh, ministered to by uh, those who are enemies of God. And so solemn messages have been entrusted to them to proclaim to the world there is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. The most solemn truth ever entrusted to mortals have been given us to proclaim to the world. The proclamation of this truth is to be a work. The world is to be warned and God's people are to be true to the trust committed to them. They are not to engage in speculation, neither are they to enter into business enterprises with unbelievers, for this will hinder them in their God-given work. Now, I can assure you that uh, we cannot proclaim the first angel's message that we are in the day of atonement when we do not even understand what the day of atonement looked like and what was required of Israel. And most of the church members, the clergy, the laity, and the normal congregant doesn't know what is the day of atonement per se. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 26 to 28, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. And so the prophet Malachi is sent to restore 
through worship in Israel. And uh, let us have a glimpse of uh, the Elijah of that day and the Elijah of uh, our time. Come to Mount Carmel, and what is the problem at Mount Carmel? The people had gone after Baalim to worship the god of Ashtoreth and to worship all the gods of Sidonians. You can read that in the book of uh, Jeremiah chapter 7. You can read that in the book of Ezekiel chapter 8 and uh, Jeremiah chapter 44. All these chapters will tell you what they were doing. And so Elijah was sent unto that nation that uh, had corrupted him, itself from the true God. And uh, Elijah came, and it was the king, by the way, the king of Israel, who had entered into a marriage with uh, Jezebel, uh, who was... Uh, 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 the queen of, uh, or the daughter of Ithabel, the, 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 the man uh, who had led his country into the worship of the, 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 the false gods of the Zidonians. And so when Jezebel is married to Ahab, the king of Israel, she brings all her false worship in Israel and Israel follows after in Wadom. And then Israel tells Ahab, it is not going to rain in this land until I speak by the word of the Lord. And it didn't rain for three and a half years. We need people to start praying right now. The reason why we are not having rain, the latter rain, it is because we are in the state of Ahab and Jezebel. And so here we encounter that prophet of the Lord. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, how long hold ye between two opinions? If the Lord God be God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Why not under a word? Because they knew that they were on the wrong side of the coin. And Elijah said, and Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. We need as the church of God to be repairing the altar of God for true worship. The things that we do being done, we, we see being done on the pulpit, the jokes, the storytelling, the fairy tales, the abominations and the falsehood that is being done on the pulpit and the altar of God. We need an Elijah to repair the altar of God. The worship of the gods we do not know that they were either worshipped by the patriarchs of, and the prophets or the apostles. These things have to be cleared of the altar of God. Verse 31, and Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the Israel, the tribes of the sons of Jacob, and to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And it came to pass, and, uh, and it came to pass at the time of uh, the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, the overcomer, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. So the work of Elijah is to bring back the people to the Lord. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. That is what we need even right now to bring back people to the true worship so that they should not be looking at men, but they should look unto Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. So in this time of well-nigh universal apostasy, God calls upon his messengers to proclaim his law in the spirit and power of Elias. As John the Baptist, in preparing a people for Christ's first advent, called their attention to the Ten Commandments, so we are to give with no uncertain sound the message, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. That is the first angel's message. With the earnestness that characterized Elijah, the prophet, and John the Baptist, we are to strive to prepare the way for Christ's second advent. And so um, it is a time that uh, every church member, every church member 
should ask themselves, am I on the side of the Lord or am I on the, uh, the side of the act deceiver? And so, um, what is the conclusion of the matter? The conclusion of the matter is this, all who depart from the Lord will perish. All who follow after vain imaginations and the teachings, the doctrines and the commandments of men shall not enter the land of promise. Those who did this in ancient Israel never stepped in the land of promise. And those who stepped in the land of promise and they went after the idols and after the manner of the nations that surrounded them, they were taken into captivity. Now, we do not have that chance of entering the promised land and then being taken into captivity. That, that is not what the Lord is going to do. We shall miss the land of promise. And so may the Lord help us to come back to the true worship. Let us know what are our distinctive messages. Let us know what it entails, the three angels' messages. Let us avoid this idolatry that is happening in the sanctuary. Let us avoid all this false worship, whether it be in music, whether it be in character, whether it be in uh, organization. Anything that is prohibited in the word of God tended towards idolatry. And we should avoid this thing. Let us shun strange gods among us. And uh, I'll read to you the book of uh, Joel as we pray. What are the clergy and the laity to do at such a time as this? The book of Joel as we Pray. Joel chapter 2, and uh, I'm going to read from verse 12. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart. Turn to me with all your heart. And with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repented him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? So blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, that is the ordinary congregants, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders of the church. Gather the children and those that suck and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of the closet. Those who are having all these delicacies of this world and still think there is a lot of time to be involved in merrymaking, let them come out of these celebrations. Let the priests, the pastors, the evangelists, the apostles, among us, and the prophets, let them, the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them, wherefore should they say among the people, where is um, their God? And uh, uh, in the book of um, Hosea, chapter, uh, chapter 6, we are told, come, and let us return unto the Lord. For he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, 
as the latter and former rain unto the earth. And so we have been praying for the latter rain. There have been sessions from 2015 about praying for the latter rain, 10 days of latter rain, 100 days of latter rain. But from 2015 until we are 2023, it doesn't seem like there is latter rain falling on the church. And why is this? Because there has been a departure from uh, uh, the simplicity of the gospel and worship and the primitive godliness that was to be found among us, the holy men who worship the God in truth and in spirit. It is a time we return to the Lord in uh, uh, simplicity, in the primitive of godliness and the latter rain that we have been praying for, it will come automatically even as our character is transformed, as even we have a relationship with Jesus. What we need right now is a relationship with Jesus and how I pray that everyone of us will have that relationship. Let us pray. Again, Father, we thank you because all that is lacking can be supplied by thy son in our lives. And so let Jesus who reigns over our souls take our hearts and seal them for thy courts above in heaven, that, Father, he may sprinkle clean water on us that we may be washed from all our idols, that we may offer an offering in righteousness, sacrifices which are not abominable in thy sight, but sacrifices which are acceptable. You tell us that we may offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Lord, we can't because we are so full of selfishness, but when Christ is enshrined in us, we can be able to surrender ourselves. And so be it, Lord, because repentance is a gift, we request that you may give it unto us, that we may repent of our idolatry, we may repent of our false worship, that uh, we may bring back the true worship to thee and thy son and not to be centered upon men uh, and looking unto men and teaching the doctrines and the commandments of men. Thank you for the Sabbath blessing. Be with your children all over the four corners of the world. This is my plea in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, wishing you all a happy Sabbath and uh, wherever you are, may the blessings of the Lord attend to you.